Hiya! Uh, time for chapter 10. This is called Wishing. Uh, you might remember the last chapter was a little bit sad because Henny was poorly, but right at the end we found out that Henny was better again. So let's see if it's time for her to come home. Two things, George, said the. Um, oh, sorry, it's called Wishing. I might have said that already. <laughs> Never mind. Two things, George, said the dentist consultant friend when the time came for Henny to be discharged from the cottage hospital. One, your Miss Hickthrift will need some time to recover. She's had a nasty illness. It'll be at least a month before she feels fit to do much. And the second thing is, are you fit for a round of golf on Saturday? <laughs> Back in Ivy Cottage, Hedy did indeed feel a bit weak. It's as though I've been run over by a steamroller, she said and she was glad of a helping hand from Angela and Barney to get her up the wooden steps to the flat at the end of each day's end, at each day's end. Mary Good would not allow her to do any work harder than sewing on a button, and encouraged her to ask for her favourite things to eat and drink. To build up your strength, she said. I remember, said Henny, that when I was once ill as a child, my mother gave me beef tea. Beef tea you shall have, said Mary. And George told her that Guinness was good for her, and that drinking port did wonders for invalids. He gave her the stout every lunchtime, and a glass of port each evening. You can just think of them as medicine, if you like, he said. Nice medicine, Henny said. The consultant was right. Not until about a month after leaving hospital did Henny begin to feel her old self again. Then one morning, Mary found her busy cleaning the insides of all the windows. Don't overdo it, will you? she said. It's you that's overdoing it, said Henny. What with George and all the children to look after, and me on top of all that lot. You've had no time even to start your French course. You need a break. Get George to take you away. Where to? Mary said. France, of course. Have a couple of nights in Paris. Mary laughed. I do have five children, you know, she said. Yes, said Henny, and you've got me. Am I not to be trusted with the children? Of course, but you've been ill, and now I'm better. Mary did put up some sort of resistance, but the thought of the delights of Paris undermined her defences. Anyway, George jumped at the idea, which Henny put to him behind his wife's back, and the children encouraged by Henny, played their parts. Just think of you and Dad strolling down the Champs-Élysées, said Angela to her mother. And going to the Louvre Museum, said Barney. And climbing the Eiffel Tower, said Eleanor. And drinking lots of wine, said Rosie. And eating frog's legs, said Rowley. Tray bong! <laughs> so it was that during half-term holiday, Henny and the five good children had Ivy Cottage all to themselves. Are you sure you'll be all right? George and Mary said as they left. They had told their next door neighbours that they would be away for two nights and George had given Barney his whistle with orders to blow it hard if there was any trouble. Well, here's a picture of George and Mary going out the door. You see they've got their bags with them and there's Henny with all the children. Like that chap with the ponytail, said Henny. Young Freddy Hooper, you mean, said George. Oh, you won't need the patent hickathrift anti-burglar bomb, Henny. Freddy's in prison, doing six months for a car theft. And remembering the money plants reminded Mary to give Henny instructions about looking after all her other plants. And that reminded George to tell Henny where the fuse box was in case the lights went wrong, and where the stop tap was in case of a pipe burst, and how to regulate the central heating, and so on and so forth, until Henny almost had to push them out of the door. Anyone would think you were going for two months, she said. Go on off with you and have a lovely time. At the very last moment, Mary said, Oh, I forgot to fill in my lottery ticket. It's in the drawer in the kitchen table. Too late now, George said. We shall miss our train. Come on, the taxi's here. Oh, Henny, said Mary. You fill it in for me, will you? Just one board, that's all I do. She looked in her purse. Oh, I haven't got a pound, only notes. I've got one, Henny said. I'll see to it. Off you go. Goodbye, goodbye, everyone called except Rowley, who shouted, 
au revoir. <laughs> After the taxi had disappeared and the children had gone back into the house, Henny stood for a moment outside Ivy Cottage, wondering what Paris was like, for she had never in her life been abroad, and hoping that Mary, George and Mary would enjoy their break. Then round the corner of the street came the sweeps van with Mr Popjoy, Saltmuth's chimney sweep at the wheel, his face as usual grimed with soot. When you saw a sweep, Henny remembered, you could have a wish. But you mustn't wish until you'd also seen a dog's tail, or it wouldn't work. As if by magic, a dog appeared from a side street, a dog with quite a long tail. What a bit of luck, thought Henny, and then she said out loud, I wish that George and Mary Good have a really lovely time in Paris. The dog came nearer, nosing about on the pavement, and then Henny recognised it. It was the same thin, collarless mongrel she had seen on the grounds on, her on the sands on her very first afternoon in Saltsmouth. It's a stray like me, she had thought then, and by the looks of it, it still was. Henny was sure it was the same animal, partly because of its colouring. It was black, with a white patch on its chest and one white forepaw. But mostly she remembered it as being different from most dogs. Its ears were not like most dogs. One stuck up, one hung down. It had quite a lot of whippet in it, Henny thought. A bit of terrier, perhaps. Maybe a bit of Labrador. Some mongrels are downright ugly, but this one was rather attractive. Or you could be, thought Henny, if someone looked after you properly and put some flesh on you. For under the black coat, the dog's ribs showed clearly. Whether Henny would have done what she did next if George and Mary had been still at home is hard to tell. But in fact, she nipped back into Ivy Cottage, went to the kitchen and looked round for something, anything to offer the hungry animal. Then she remembered. Yesterday they had had sausages and mash, and surprisingly, considering the goods good appetites, there had been one sausage left over. She took it from the fridge and hurried back to the front door. The black dog was still in sight, though it had moved a little further up the street. Henny whistled. At the sound, the dog looked round. One ear cocked, one drooping. Here, called Henny, look! And she held out the sausage. Cautiously, the dog moved nearer, the muzzle lifted to test the air. Let's picture here, look, see Henny in the door. You can see his, uh, the little dog's ears, one up, one down, and Henny holding a sausage. Poor old boy, said Henny. You haven't just been starved. You've had a few kicks in your time, I reckon. But I won't hurt you, and this will do you good. It's one of Mr Braintree the butcher's very best pork sausages. Come on, it's all for you. A present from one stray to another. Drawn by the sights and smell of the food and lulled by the sound of a gentle, friendly voice, the black mongrel forgot his fears and with a sudden movement snatched the prize from Henny's fingers. In two or three bites, he gulped it down and his long, thin tail began slowly to wag. Nice, asked Henny, and the tail wagged faster. Henny, standing in the open doorway of the house that had become her home, looked at the homeless young dog and was tempted. While the cat's away, she heard her mother say, the mice will play. Let's just see if he will come inside, she thought. George and Mary need never know he did. And then I can at least find him a proper meal of something before he goes off to wander about the streets alone again. The front door of Ivy Cottage had originally been the front door of the middle cottage in the row of three from which the present house had been made. Inside there was a longish passage with various rooms on either side of it that led directly to a garden door at the rear of the house. This in turn led to the sloping lawn at the back. Now, leaving the front door wide open, Henny walked along the passage, opened the garden door at the far end and left it so, and then sat down on the seat where she usually sat to watch the children play croquet. The hoops and mallets and balls had all been put away for the winter now, and the lawn was empty except for a couple of seagulls that were walking about on the grass, regarding Henny with cold yellow eyes. Henny sat quite still, looking out over the sea wall below. 
You silly old woman, she said to herself. Did you really imagine he'd follow you, a total stranger? But then suddenly the seagull squawked and lifted hastily away off the lawn, and Henny felt a cold nose nuzzling her hand. Oh, the little dog has come in. So, I wonder what will happen in the next chapter. Will Henny keep the dog? What will the good say when they come home and find not only has Henny brought, found a dog, but she's brought it into the house as well? Have to wait and see. Bye-bye.